Matthew chapter number 15. We'll start reading down verse number 7. Heavenly Father, as we come before your word, we dear, ask you, dear God, that your uh, hand would be upon the message, Lord, and God, that we'd hear from heaven tonight. I pray, Lord, that you'd open your words to us, and God, I pray that you'd just take the message you've laid on my heart, Lord, speak it through my mouth, and Lord, uh, may the hearers and the hearts of those who hear, uh, God, may they be receptive to what you have for us tonight, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Matthew chapter 15, verse number 7, the Bible says, ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, this people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. As we know, there's a lot of religion out there in this world, amen? There's a lot of religion that is not true worship of God, and uh, people oftentimes comfort themselves with acknowledging that there is a God, and you'll, you know, you'll hear people say many times, when you try to talk to them about the Lord, well, I believe that there is a God, I, I believe in God, and that sort of thing, but they don't really take the next step of getting to know God. They say, yeah, he's got to be there somewhere, but they don't really pursue getting to know the Lord. And so instead, they substitute things uh, for knowing God that can be easily understood, things that they can identify with, and, and uh, they put aside the harder task of really getting to know God in a personal way. And so as the Bible says here, they teach man's commandments instead of God's commandments. And they emphasize man's pleasure instead of God's pleasure. And they focus on man's feelings instead of on God, how God feels about things. And they manufacture man's righteousness instead of God's. And so really, they put themselves in the place of God and make their religion or their faith, their worship about them and not about the God of heaven. And so they go so far as to acknowledge the existence of God, but then insist on defining God in their own terms. And uh, as I mentioned before from the pulpit here, I've heard people say, had people say to me, well, my God is a God of, like they just have their own concept of God based on how they feel or what they want their God to be. And that's not how it works. God defines himself, amen? And uh, we have to go with his definition. So uh, they sometimes acknowledge the existence of God, but then they define him in their own terms and they worship him in their own way. And, and people will actually say that. Well, I worship God in my own way, you know, at Walmart, you know, out on the golf course, at the beach. You know, I like to worship God on the beach. It's nice when the weather's good and, you know, they never seem to worship God in shoveling snow in the driveway in the wintertime, I guess. But, uh, you know, they, they find a way to worship God that's pleasing and placating to us. And that's, that's really the way things work a lot of times. So that is not how God intended it to work. And that's not something that's acceptable to him. God created us to have direct fellowship with him. That's the way it was in the garden, right? In the Garden of Eden, they had fellowship with God each day, walked with God in the cool of the day, and uh, sin, of course, forced mankind to be removed from the direct presence of God. There's just no way we could endure uh, the direct presence of God and have fellowship with him in that way, uh, being uh, in, in a sinful condition. So, of course, Jesus came to restore the direct fellowship that we have from God. Now, these are things, if you're a Christian, you know these basic fundamentals, but I'm just kind of walking you through a path of logic, Bible logic here, if you will, tonight. And so we lost that fellowship with God. That spiritual connection was broken, and Jesus came to restore that. And so we read things like this in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 13. You can turn there if you would. Ephesians 2 and verse 13 and 14. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, that's us, all of us, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Thank God. For he, that is Jesus, is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Thank God. That barrier that was between us and God has been done away with through Jesus Christ. Look at verse 16. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you, which were far off, and to them that were nigh. For through him, that is through Jesus, we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. You notice that's capital S, that's referring to God's Holy Spirit. We have access to God now. We, we were far off before. You say, well, how far is far off? Anywhere distant from God is too far, amen? We were far off, we're now made nigh by the blood of Christ, and we have access by his spirit unto the Father. Verse number 19 says, Now therefore, 
Ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. So that's what happened when we got saved. Thank God. We, uh, all that barrier that was between us and God, we, can, we have that spiritual connection restored now. And uh, once we're born again, we'll, uh, even while we're inhabiting this, this sin-cursed world and in this sin-cursed body, we still can have fellowship with God because we're spiritually connected to him. Now, when we get to heaven, we're going to be fully and eternally connected to God. We'll back, be back enjoying that direct you know, my, uh, God shall dwell with them and, and be their God. We'll see him face to face. Amen. We'll be in the, in the literal presence of God. But I want you to know something right now. The Bible says where two or three are gathered together, he is there in the midst. Spiritually, we're in the presence of God right now. But it doesn't seem the same as when we get to heaven, we're looking at him. In, why? Because we are very focused and used to the physical. And so, unfortunately, many Christians never... Uh, grow to appreciate the value of a spiritual relationship and a spiritual connection that we can have with God right now. And so we look forward with great anticipation to that time when we're going to see him face to face. But his presence is just as real right now. His power is just as real right now. His indwelling spirit that's in us is just as much uh, so right now. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter number 13. So when we get saved, you understand the concept. We get spiritually reconnected. We get plugged in. Uh, we became a, a child of God. And, and 1 Corinthians 13 verse 11 says, When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. In other words, when we grow up and mature, we're not as dependent on the, the childish things, the direct uh, gratifications of what we're used to seeing and hearing and feeling and all that sort of thing. Verse number 12, so when I became a man, I put away childish things, as speaking of maturity. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I also am, uh, as also I am known. And so, yes, it's, it's going to be a perfect knowledge of God at that time when we're in his presence, but right, right now, it's kind of like looking through a dark glass. We can't see everything clearly, but it's still just as much real. And God is still just as much real. And so uh, this is not a new struggle. Humans have always had, I say humans, like us, <laughs> amen. We've always had a hard time identifying with and having interest in the spiritual versus the physical. I mean, from the time that we're born and all that we're introduced to and all of the appetites that are cultivated in our life throughout life, uh, they really uh, mostly appeal to the physical and to the material. Things you can see, things you can touch, things that you can hear. And so we have a, a, a lot more difficulty in just kind of developing that interest and that awareness of spiritual things. And so as a result... We see many illustrations of people substituting other things for a spiritual relationship with God, and they substitute other things and pretend. And, and so, it, it, you know, as we read there when we began, that they teach for doctrines the commandments of, of men rather than the commandments of God. They substitute things that they can grasp hold of and understand as opposed to the reality of walking with God. Look back at Exodus chapter 32. <coughs> Exodus chapter number 32, and I'll just uh, go through here with you a few except, or, uh, illustrations, if you will. <clears throat> Exodus 32 and verse number 1, and one of the things that, that we see that people, and this is a general principle, that they substitute for that spiritual relationship with God is something that is available to human perception. That is something you can put your hands or your eyes on. And look what we read here in, in uh, Exodus 32. Verse number one, the Bible says, And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not as what has become of him. For, and Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool. And he, uh, after he had made a molten calf, and they said, 
These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Now you think about the context of that. We're in Exodus 32. Back in Exodus chapter 9, they had just heard from God in the mount. When the mountain was smoking and quaking and the great uh, you know, fire was going up and, and there was a voice like a trumpet that sounded long. And they ended up saying, uh, Moses, you go talk to God and tell us what he said. <laughs> because that was overwhelming to them. And uh, they had received his law in Exodus chapter 20. In fact, back a, a few chapters further in Exodus chapter 14, uh, God had opened up the Red Sea and led them across on dry land and then drowned Pharaoh and his army after that. And now they seek to reduce God to some material object that they had crafted for themselves. You think about that. How, you think, how could they do that? They'd seen the works of God. They had heard the voice of God. They had experienced the law of God. All these things were going on. How could they possibly, but they make, they make a golden calf. And then they go, here's your gods that brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Why? Because it's something you can see. It's something you can touch and put your hands on. Something. But, you know, we're not that different. We may not be bowing down to a golden calf and things like that, but we oftentimes substitute things of human perception for that spiritual relationship with God. I want to see something happen. I want to do something. I want to, I want to see some physical manifestation of something. But God is there in his spiritual reality. Look at Numbers chapter 11 with me, if you would. Numbers chapter 11, verses 4 through 6. Another thing that we oftentimes, and even today, we, we substitute for that spiritual connection and relationship to God is human indulgence. What makes me feel good? What do I like? What appeals to me? Uh, Numbers chapter 11, verses 4 through 6, the Bible says, The mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting. And the children of Israel also wept again, said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish through which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, and the onions, and the garlic. But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. Now, what was the manna? That was God's supernatural provision. That was something that God had provided to sustain them uh, in, in the deepest, darkest places of the wilderness where there was uh, nothing, hardly any vegetation and things. And they despised what God had given them for things that appealed to the appetites of their flesh. Now back in verses 1 and 2 in Numbers 11, they had just faced the judgment of God for complaining. And here again, they're dissatisfied with what God had provided wanting something that's more appealing to their flesh. And that's why people leave churches. That's why people don't, that, what the Bible says, there will come a time in the last days where they'll not endure sound doctrine. They'll heap, heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. It's like, oh yeah, that feels good. Yeah, I, I, like, I like what you're saying there. That feels good. Oh, I like that music. Listen, there is, there is nothing wrong with having a feeling that, that brings pleasure to the senses but not to the exclusion of what's ministering to your spirit. God is a, a, God's connection with us is a spiritual one right now. And so we look for things that we can perceive and touch and feel and, and taste. And then we look for things that we can indulge ourselves and things that appeal to us and, and things that we like. And then look at 1 Samuel chapter 8. And we see this a lot of times in different kinds of relationships, whether it's... Uh, you know, relationship with friends, relationship within a family, and even within churches, that sometimes people, for, for, instead of having a direct relationship with God, they substitute human leadership. Why do all these churches have all this hierarchy, right, uh, of who goes who and who's in charge of who and somebody else is in charge of them and all the way up to the guy that's really in charge, but yet the Bible says Christ is the head of the church. He is before all things and by him all things consist. So look at 1 Samuel chapter 8, and verses 4 through 7. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Let's do like everybody else is doing. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord, and the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, 
but they have rejected me, God said, that I should not reign over them. You know, so many times Christians want to ride on somebody else's spiritual coattails. Well, let me do like they're doing and I'll be okay and I'll be spiritual. Why don't you do like God told you to do? Why don't you walk with God and, and, work, and allow God to speak to your heart and allow God to work in your life? Now here in 1 Samuel chapter 8, uh, they had just come out of the years and years of, of judges and God raising up deliverers and different ones would judge them for a while and then they go into apostasy and they get in trouble again and God raise up another deliverer. They gone through years of failure of human leadership and uh, then failures of, of Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas. Uh, the, Eli was a high priest and, and, and uh, Hophni and Phinehas, Phinehas her, their, his sons rather, were, were actually uh, committing immorality with people come to the, to the tabernacle and, and God was displeased with that. So they're, they're, they had witnessed years and, and generations of failure of human leadership. But now they're rejecting God in favor of give us a man to lead us. And God said, Samuel, don't worry about it. They haven't rejected you. They rejected me. And so they think the answer is some other human leader. And many times, you know, as Christians today, people will, they'll be looking for some new book, some new system, some new program, some author, some preacher, some guru, some something, somebody to follow. Hey, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We're, that's who we're supposed to follow. We're supposed to be guided by the Holy Spirit of God. But wait a minute, that puts responsibility back on me. I'd rather just be able to say, well, I did what the preacher told me to, and look how it turned out. <laughs> Amen. And so we look for human leadership. We look for human indulgences. We, we look for human relationships and human perception. And it seems like we're always looking to substitute, listen to me, something carnal. That is something we can identify with and grasp easily to, uh, instead of the true satisfaction of a spiritual relationship with God. It's just, you know, it's like, oh, spiritual, that's too hard. I don't get it. I don't understand. How, how do we quantify that? How do, we, how do we identify that? How do we define that? But spiritual is the only way to know God. Say, so how do you know that? Well, just because the Bible says. <laughs> Look with me at John chapter 4. John chapter 4. So we started off reading how that they teach for doctrines the commandments of men. And uh, then you see how they substituted different things, and we have, they did, uh, where we're just not comfortable with that spiritual relationship, and so we substitute carnal things. But here's what it says in John 4, 23. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. So there's two primary things that, guard, that, that guide our relationship with God personally. That is truth and spirit. It's a spiritual relationship, and it's based on God's truth. In verse number 24, God is a spirit. Jesus said in another, in another place, said, no man has seen God at any time. You never laid eyes on God. There, there is no figure, there is no substance uh, in, in a physical way of God. Oh, the only begotten of the Father, he hath declared him. The only physical manifestation of God that there was ever on this earth was the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so God is a spirit, verse 24, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So the truth is, you can call it whatever you want. You cannot have a true connection with God if you don't understand a spiritual relationship. If you don't have a spiritual relationship with him. So why do people struggle so much with connecting with the spiritual? Well, because it's not as easily definable. It's, it's just, you try, try explaining something ser uh, spiritual. It's hard to do that in words. And we say, well, it's, it's like this, it's like this. And, and what did Jesus say in John chapter 3? The spirit is like wind. It blows wherever it wants. You can, you can see the effects of it, but you can't actually see the wind. And so, so is everyone that is born of the spirit. So you say, well, we need something more easily definable. Well, hold on. God gave you the law. That was very explicit and very definable. How do we do with that? Not so good. So it's not about something that we say, well, I just, I need a list of stuff that we can do. No, that, that failed. 
What we need is to have a true spiritual relationship with God. Why else do we struggle with things that are spiritual? Because they're not visible. Well, let's just be honest. It's, it's hard to really connect with things you can't see. And you can't audibly hear. I understand we hear the voice of God, but it's a spiritual connection. It's not hearing voices in your head. If you got that problem, either quit eating so much pizza and drinking so much coffee, or go see a psychiatrist, amen. It's not about, when somebody says, I heard the voice of God, it's not hearing crazy little voices in your head. So we, we struggle with, this, with spiritual things because they're not visible. You can't hear them. They're not tangible. Uh, not only that, they're not, what I'll call it, not static. Well, that means that there, it's not something that's exactly the same every time. It, it, when you have a, a, a spiritual experience with God, it's not going to be exactly the same every time. I mean, sometimes it'll bring a lump to your throat. Sometimes it'll bring tears to your eyes. Sometimes it'll just want you to raise your hand, praise and worship God. I mean, it can manifest in many different ways and affect us in many different ways. So it's not static in that it's not the same. And yet God never changes. God's still there, but thank God he's not boring. Amen. God isn't boring. And so he's consistent and he never changes. But our relationship with him is dynamic and changes as time goes on. So what, anybody think of some other things that make it hard to connect with something spiritual? I mean, just think about you personally. What, what makes it hard to, and not just with God, but just anything spiritual. Eric. Yeah, sure. So that idea of discernment, that's a very good point. You know, is that really God telling me to do that? Or what, you know, is that, is that something that God's showing me or God's impressing me to do? Or is it just me talking myself into it, right? <laughs> because we can do it. And, and, you know, the Bible says that the, that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So, so we can't just follow our heart. That's the wrong thing to do. But there are some checks and balances that can help us get those things. Uh, but what else? Anything? Distractions. Yeah, amen. I mean, we have all kinds of things to distract our attention and look over here and look over here. And so it, it is hard to maintain that. Um, it's kind of like, I guess, the, way, the reason that some people get addicted to things because it's just, it's a much easier, more immediate gratification, mm. right? So it's like, oh, pray. No, how about I watch TV? That'll be fun, right? And so we, we struggle. So you understand what I'm saying, okay? I, we could go on and on with uh, endless illustrations about it, but we understand it's difficult for us in the context that we live typically to connect with things that are of a spiritual nature. Mm -hmm. And so when I want you to think about this in the Bible, and, and hopefully you're familiar somewhat with his life and, and uh, with, uh, you know, how he lived and, and this book that he wrote called the Psalms, David. David is a great example of pursuing God spiritually. Spiritually. Now, I hesitate to use any person, man, whether it's the Apostle Paul or, you know, King David or Noah or, or Daniel, because they're all imperfect. We're all imperfect. But that's not the point. The point is he is a tremendous illustration of pursuing God spiritually. You think about the Psalms. The Psalms are filled with prayers. A lot of them are prayers. Of songs of worship, of praise to God, of seeking God's guidance, seeking God's protection, and begging God's forgiveness. Like David is talking to God like he's really there. Like he's calling out to God. He said, I cried. This poor man cried, and God heard me. Amen. He lifted me up out of a miry pit and set my feet upon a rock and established my goals. And he put a new song in my heart. Hallelujah. Yeah, David got a little, a little Pentecostal, I believe that. <laughs> but many times in the life of David, you'll find this phrase, he inquired of the Lord. He inquired of the Lord. Even today, many Christians charge ahead through life without ever hardly inquiring of the Lord and considering, God, what do you want me to do? It's just like, oh, I know what to do here. It's like you're talking about earlier. I, I got this hand. No, do we really know what to do? Just because it was right to do before doesn't mean it's right in that situation. And so constantly you see David inquired of the Lord. That he's, he's, he's looking to God for direction and for guidance. A true spiritual relationship with God can't be simple. 
Now, there's another reason why we don't like it. We want simple, predictable, direct, you know, what's the recipe? How many cups? Convert it to grams. Call Siri, you know, how many grams in a cup of flour? <laughs> I've heard that somewhere before. I can't imagine where it was. But, but a spiritual relationship with God is anything but simple. It's anything but routine and predictable. And so I, I believe God makes it that way because you know what happens when you and I be, uh, have things in our life that become routine? We take them for granted. We, they start to get boring. They start to get, we lose interest in things. So God is like fresh manna every day. And so it has to be fresh. It has to be real. It has to come from our heart and, and a heart that wants to pursue God and loves God. You think about what it's like when you love someone. If you don't have anybody like that in your life right now, I'm sorry, but there, there probably was one at, at one time and uh, you wanted their attention. You wanted their affection. You wanted their approval. And you think about that and what were you willing to do to earn that? <laughs> we were willing to do pretty much anything, amen? <laughs> like, yes, I will skateboard across the... Uh, <laughs> I'll go across the Potomac, forget the book. <laughs> I mean, we'll do anything. When you love somebody, it's like, I want their approval, I want their attention, I want their affection. And, and what are we willing to give up? You know, well, I, what, what can I do for you, honey? Anything you want, darling, you know? Uh, now, I want you to think about this in your own life right now. What kind of things can you identify as truly spiritual in your life right now? I asked myself this question earlier. I'll, I'll ask myself again, just so I'll be with you. But what kind of things can you identify in your, in your own life? Don't ha I'm not asking you to respond verbally. I just want you to think about this in your mind. What kind of things can you identify? That, that, well, that, that right there, that's truly spiritual. Now, what's that mean? It means it's not dependent on anything physical or material. There's nothing involved that, that's, uh, you know, there's a physical thing that is a material thing. There's, uh, there's nothing, doesn't necessarily appeal to the satisfying of our flesh. It not, not, doesn't necessarily give us a good feeling. It doesn't necessarily, you know, say, oh, that, that was wonderful. It, it doesn't have any physical substance or material substance. It doesn't rely on any human leadership. No direct, no direction from a person or a confidence, just, just truly spiritual. There's just, typically there's not a lot in our lives because our lives, our waking moments are consumed with physical interactions, material interactions, human interactions. And I believe that's why God said, woe unto them that lay house to house, that, that man cannot get alone with God. And you, sometimes we have to get alone with God. The harder we struggle to identify things at, that are spiritual, that are part of our daily life, the more likely it is that we're spiritually impaired. In other words, if we can't easily go, well, you know, that, that, it's not strong, but it's there, that's spiritual, and, and that part's spiritual, the harder we have to think about that, the more likely it is that we are spiritually impaired, that we're, we haven't grown spiritually as we should. You think about just the exercise of prayer. And when we're praying, we're talking to someone who's not visibly there. That's what prayer is. Whether you're praying out loud, praying by yourself, or with somebody else, we pray here during services. I hope you pray at your, your house. I pray at my house. But we're talking to somebody who's not visibly there. And it requires an exercise of faith to believe that what you're doing is really working. That you're not just speaking into the air, but somebody's on the other end listening and they can do something about it. It requires an exercise of faith. And there's no human leadership in prayer. I understand, you know, we say that in service, so-and-so lead us in prayer and that sort of thing. But the Bible says in Romans 8, it's the Holy Spirit that leads us in prayer. He teaches us what we ought to pray for because we, we know not what we ought to pray for as we ought. And so the exercise of prayer is a very spiritual exercise. And perhaps that's why so many Christians struggle to pray. And I've talked to a lot of Christians who have a hard time praying. Because it's a spiritual exercise more than most things we do as a Christian. The same is true of Bible reading. To read your Bible faithfully and consistently, and especially to get something, I almost said especially, 
<laughs> but especially to get something out of it. Because the Bible says, a natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, neither can he know them, for they're spiritually discerned. So even if you're reading the words and you're understanding, comprehending, you got great reading, great comprehension, you can't really understand them if there's not a spiritual thing going on there. So prayer, Bible reading, it requires a spiritual appetite of receiving something from God with a, a genuine affection for God's voice. To be able to, again, it's not the audible voice, it's the words of God speaking to your heart and mind and resonating in a way that just like, yes, I get that truth. That helped me, that strengthened me, that shed some light on something that gave some encouragement. It's a spiritual exercise. I'll say this, if the only interest that you have in reading the Bible is something that is intellectually stimulating, like it's a, like it's a research book, like, oh, look, oh look, that's fascinating. Let's go back and search that out. Now, I do that kind of stuff. And I'll say that's wrong, but if that's your only thing you're getting from the Bible, is it stimulating your intellect, then you're going to quickly get bored and start to neglect it if there's not a spiritual interaction. But when there's a spiritual interaction and you're reading and you're like, da, 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 ding, oh, ho, ho, look at that. And God just speaks to your heart. When that happens, it makes the Bible more real. So prayer is a spiritual exercise. The Bible reading is a spiritual exercise. What about witnessing and sharing the gospel? Well, that too is a spiritual exercise. It's not just a mental debate. If you're just having a mental debate or, 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 or you know, sharing information, you're not really witnessing to somebody. You're letting them see you, not letting them see God. So you think about this. Why do we lack confidence to witness so much? When Jesus said this, let me read it to you, Luke 12 and verse 11. And when they bring you unto synagogues and unto magistrates and powers, take ye no thought how or what thing ye shall answer or what ye shall say. For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what you ought to say. But God basically says, open your mouth and I'll fill it. Now, a little background there is, do we have the responsibility to read the word of God so that Holy Spirit can bring it to remembrance? Yes. If we don't put it in, there's nothing there to remember. We're just a, a blank slate. But the thing is, we'll never be fully prepared to speak out for God. Well, when I know everything and I have all the answers, we'll never be fully prepared. But without the Holy Spirit teaching us what to say and bringing, our, bringing things to our remembrance, then we can't witness. So witnessing is a spiritual exercise. Prayer, Bible reading. What about resisting temptation and keeping from drifting away from God? That's a very spiritual exercise. Again, that's a spiritual battleground with a spiritual enemy who the Bible says is seeking whom he may devour. So, oh, how many times have we said to ourselves, maybe not word for word, but, oh, if I had only seen that coming, <laughs> right? I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have made that decision. I would have acted that way if I had only seen it come. That's every regret we have in our life. But the fact is we're fighting a spiritual battle of something we can't see. And so if we don't have spiritual discernment from God, then we're going to miss those things. So all of the most common struggles that Christians have are because we're spiritually weak. We're spiritually immature. We're spiritually vulnerable. That's why we struggle so much, because we're struggling with the spiritual part of our relationship with God and of our relationship to other people. 2 Timothy 4.10 says, for example, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Why do he do that? Spiritual weakness. He found the world to be more attractive. The more weak you are spiritually, the more attractive the world is going to become to you. So what do I have to do to grow and become stronger spiritually? That's how you're supposed to bring it all to a conclusion, right? Raise the issue, show the conflict, and then give the resolution. What do I have to do? What's my list <laughs> to become stronger spiritually? Well, if you mean what's my checklist that I have to perform... That in itself is looking for a humanistic solution to a spiritual problem. Let me just think about this again. You're looking for a humanistic relationship. Let, let me take some notes. I'm ready to take notes now. I'm awake now. <laughs> All right, what, what is he going to say? This is how I solve the problem. All right? Instead, I believe we have to 
keep doggedly pursuing God like David did. It's not a list of functions to perform. It is keeping our heart tender, keeping our eyes on Jesus, keeping our focus on him and developing. You say, when will it be developed? It never will be fully developed this side of heaven because there's always going to be room for improvement. So keep developing a relationship with God day by day. Now you think about the life of David, and hopefully you'll recall enough about him uh, when I say these things that you'll say, oh, okay, I, I see what he's saying there. Uh, from the time that he spent hours alone with God watching the sheep. Remember what, what he was doing when, when he got called to go take some cheese and bread to his, his brethren in the army? He was out, out by himself. I killed a bear, I killed a lion. Well, that wasn't little old David that did that. But he had some fellowship with God out there alone. You know, two of the scariest things for a modern Christian a lot of times is being alone and being quiet. Even that right there is uncomfortable, isn't it? <laughs> What's he doing? Is he having a stroke? Did he forget what he was going to say? <laughs> I'm okay. <laughs> being alone, being quiet. David spent hours and hours and hours alone fellowshipping with God out there in the wilderness, watching the sheep, to the way that he welcomed the Spirit of God by playing music for Saul. Remember, remember when he got called into the court and, and, and David said, who's that guy that plays the harp? And Saul said, who's that guy that plays the harp? Well, that's David, Jesse's son. Well, bring him in here. I like the way he played. And every time an evil spirit started affecting Saul's attitude, David started playing. And that spirit would change. You know why? Because David wasn't just saying, hey, listen to this one, Saul. You know, no, he wasn't doing that. He was ministering spiritually. He was playing and singing in such a way. You read the Psalms, those are songs he wrote. He was ministering spiritually in such a way that welcomed the Spirit of God. And, and so David learned that. You think about the way that he was determined to keep the principles of God. Like, here he is fleeing for his life. He's already been anointed king. But he says to Joab, said, no, we're not going to touch God's anointed. We're, we're fleeing from Saul. When God's ready to remove him and install me as king, then God will do it, but I'm not touching him. That's some principle right there. But David, he, he was determined to keep the principles of God. Uh, think about the way that he called on God for power and direction in battles. You read about that first and second Samuel, parts of Chronicles, throughout the Psalms. Oh, Lord, many are the wicked that arise up against me. Oh, Lord, deliver me. Oh, God, see. Oh, God, move. Be my shield. Be my buckler. Be my high tower. May the Spirit of God. And, and he was just looking to God. He was the greatest general. He won more battles. They said Saul slain his thousands. David slain his ten thousands. I mean, he was a thousand times better than, than Saul was. And yet... He's just looking to God for direction and for power in his battles. Think about the way that he shamelessly celebrated God, even when some others rebuked him. The ark of God was coming in Jerusalem. David's there dancing before the Lord with all his might, shouting, praising God, dancing around, and his own wife, Michael. Oh, how gloriously, you know. <laughs> yeah, just like that. <laughs> well, how gloriously you were out there today. He said, I didn't read that. You need to read that Bible, amen? But he was like, you know, I forget exactly how he responded, but he says, you think that was something? Watch this. <laughs> he basically, he, he was the first one to double down on something. He said, you think that was worship? Wait till you see what I do after a water break, amen? <clears throat> and so he shamelessly celebrated God even when other people mocked him and, and, and uh, rebuked him. Think about the way that he begged God's forgiveness when he messed up. I, I take you back to Psalm 51. Man, what that tremendous, tremendous psalm of repentance. God against thee and thee only have I sinned, sinned and done this wickedness in thy sight. I mean, just over and over. He's no excuses, God. I failed. I messed up. God, please forgive me. God, please... You know what he said? Renew a right spirit within me. 
God, I have sinned and messed up, and I don't, I don't want to be away from that spiritual connection. He knew what it was to walk with God. And he said, God, I don't want to lose that. Please restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. And then he said, I'll, I'll praise you before the heathen. So you think about the way he begged God's forgiveness when he messed up. You think about the way that he gave and prepared for God's work right up until his death. From the time that he became king all the way to the time of his death, he was putting things aside and gathering things and making plans and educating his son on this is how we're going to build the temple. And, and I mean, he just spent his whole life dedicated to that. You know what? You look at those things from the hours out there in the shepherd field to, to the, the dying days in the palace. David just pursued God. He took some detours like we all do. He dropped the ball. He messed up when he numbered Israel and all this. Let's not look at where he fell. Let's look at what he did. His heart was after God. His heart was after God. And so it's not about the isolated actions that we perform. It's not about how many bad decisions we've made. Thank God. It's about persistence. It's not a checklist. It's not a one, two, three, A, B, C, D, bullet point, bullet point, bullet point. It's not like that. It's about a daily getting up, seeking God's forgiveness, and pursuing God that day. And doing it all over again the next day. And doing it all over again the next day. And when we fail, get up and go back at it again the next day. And when we've had a triumph, don't rest on your laurels and think, I have arrived. Just get up again and do it all over again the next day. It is about relentlessly pursuing God and seeking to strengthen and mature that spiritual relationship and connection with him because we just don't naturally understand it we understand this we understand this right we understand this but we don't understand We don't understand quiet. We don't understand alone. We know not what we should pray for as we ought. We don't understand how to get things from the Bible where we've read the chapter a million times. And where'd that come from? <laughs> because it's spiritual. A spiritual relationship with God. Becoming spiritual is always a work in progress. It's always a work in progress. We just have to keep pursuing him. Our Heavenly Father, I pray tonight that you bless the message. Lord, I pray that you'd awaken our hearts and our minds, that we would search through our lives and see what and how much is spiritual. And Lord, if we compare that to how much is physical and carnal and material, Lord, most of the time, even in my own life, Lord, it's, it's inundated by the physical and carnal and, spirit and, and uh, material. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to work to, Lord, to, not to work, but to yield ourselves, to have that spiritual connection to you, to listen to the voice of God, to read the words of God, to seek the face of God in prayer. Lord, to tell other people about God and experience the Spirit of God moving through us. Lord, to uh, help God, the, the Holy Spirit of God, to keep us from temptations and snares and from straying away and our hearts growing cold lord without that true spiritual relationship we're just going to go hot and cold hot and cold up and down in and out all the rest of our life and lord the more spiritually weak we are the harder it is to identify any spiritual strength so lord i pray that you'd lead us in that direction help us to have a hunger for it and help us to think about it tonight and tomorrow lord when we get up and then the next day and the next day that we might seek a new experience, a new walk, a new day with our Lord Jesus Christ and the spirit that dwells within us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.